بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى We thank him for everything that he has blessed us with We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his entire household and all his companions, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all and bless every single one of us. My brothers and sisters, Surah An-Nisa is a surah that is named after the women. And one of the reasons why it is named after the women is from the very beginning of that surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies rulings regarding women. And he instructs the men folk not to deceive their women in so many different ways regarding marriage as well as regarding inheritance and so many other rules and regulations. So inshallah, we will go through some of the reasons of revelation of some of these verses. And inshallah, we'll commence with verse number four of Surah An-Nisa. There is a narration made mention of by Ibn Kathir rahmatullahi alayhi in his tafsir and Ibn Abi Hatim. He says that there was a time when the men used to marry women and give them what is known as a mahr. Mahr is a gift. It's a gift that is given from the groom to the bride. It is not a bride price. It is not a dowry per se, but it is a gift that is given from the groom to the bride. And it is encouraged that this gift is not something major, not something big. It's, it is supposed to be something as a token and at the same time that which acknowledges the right of ownership of a female. So some of the men, they give their women this wealth and later on they want it back or they use it or they claim it. You know how it is? You say, you know, I need this, you know, I have to do a business deal. And so because of that business deal, I need the money. And she says, I don't have money. What about the mahar I gave you? May Allah forgive us, really. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us forgiveness. What about the mahar? And so the woman is put into a corner and that money is taken away from her, never to be seen again. It happens, doesn't it? See, the men are actually nodding their heads. May Allah forgive us all. My brothers and sisters, sometimes men marry women who are wealthy and make use of their wealth without their permission. Yes, if they are to give you their permission and they are happy and they are ready to spend on you, then why not? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all in terms of goodness. But when it comes to the wealth of a female that is her ownership, remember, you cannot just claim it without her being absolutely happy to give it to you. And this is why clarifying the position of these women and the fact that that money that you've given them, you are supposed to give them on the time that you have said you will give them. Don't say, okay, I'm going to give you 25,000 US dollars as a mahar. Who wouldn't marry such a man? Mashallah. $25,000 as a mahar. And then? The time comes and you haven't given a cent. Ten years have passed and you say, no, just write it down. It'll come, inshallah. That's not how it's supposed to be. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, verse number four of Surah An-Nisa, Give the women the due, their dowry graciously. Give it to them. It is theirs in terms of ownership. Yes, if they were to give it to you themselves with full happiness, then you may consume from it. Otherwise, you and I know it's not allowed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us respect our women folk. Regarding verse number six of the same surah, there is an interesting story, muttafaqun alayh, reported by Imam Bukhari and Muslim, rahmatullahi alayhima. 
uh, narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha. She says that those who used to look after the orphans, they fell into two categories of people. Some of them were wealthy, some of them were poor. Sometimes you have your relatives who've passed away and the children, you have to look after them. They happen to be orphans. Now it's difficult because Allah has given a warning in the Quran. You know what Allah says? Those who consume the wealth of the orphan unduly, they have consumed the fire of Jahannam. They have consumed the fire of hell. Imagine what a stern warning. So you find people prefer not to use the wealth that belongs to the orphan but rather use their own wealth. So you're looking after the orphan child, perhaps a nephew of yours, a niece of yours, whoever it may be, and you do not use your own wealth. But some people were poor and the poor, they found it difficult to look after the, the orphans. Sometimes the well-being of these orphans, it costs money. Nowadays, people might be talking about costs of school fees, perhaps medical expenses, various other expenses and so on. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it quite simple for us all. Aisha radiallahu anha says, this verse was revealed in order to give the permission to the one who is slightly poorer to take in due measure from the wealth of the orphan. Now, where will the orphan have got the wealth from? Well, if the father died and left behind the wealth, they should be having something and you should be perhaps a guardian of that wealth. You're not allowed to just claim from that wealth the wealth of the orphan that might have come into your hands because you happen to be a guardian. You're not allowed to just consume that wealth. No, you cannot just have it for yourself. But the expenses that you may have in terms of looking after the child, you can claim it from that amount. Remember this. So Allah says clearly, the one who is wealthy, he should try and abstain. You don't need to take from that orphan's wealth. You are wealthy. Allah has given you money. Look after the orphan and for you is Jannah. But for a person who is poor, Allah says you may consume from that wealth in that which is common, that which is known, that which is the norm. So don't think to yourself, okay, I'm going to charge rental for this home of mine. But all of you are living in there anyway. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and may he grant us enlightenment with this beautiful verse. Verse number 11 of Surah An-Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of the verses of inheritance. There are two separate incidents. The one which is the common incident regarding the main uh, part of the verse where it is reported in Sunan Abi Dawood as well as Sunan At-Tirmidhi and Imam Ahmad has made mention of it in his Musnad Hadith of Jabir radiallahu an. He says the wife of Sa'd ibn al-Rabi' radiallahu anhu came to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam with a complaint. What was the complaint? Oh messenger, I am the wife of Sa'd ibn al-Rabi' radiallahu anhu. As you know, he has been martyred in the battle of Uhud. He has left behind only two daughters. And their uncle, meaning the brother of Sa'd ibn al-Rabi' he claimed all their wealth. So they have nothing. We need money for them in order for them to get married. And I need money to look after them and so on. This wealth is needed. Here comes the brother. He claimed the wealth and he's gone. Now, my brothers and sisters, let's pause for a moment. Look at the sister or it's a Sahabiya, sister of ours in faith, much higher than us in rank, obviously. The wife of Sa'ad ibn al-Rabi'a radiallahu an. She's complaining. Similar complaints come to us. Today, where people say, or the sisters say, my brother has taken the bulk of the money. They're not giving it to me. These people haven't distributed the inheritance. 30 years have passed. May Allah forgive us. If you want your books to be sealed and closed properly, sort out the matters of inheritance no matter what. May Allah forgive those who've passed away and may Allah forgive us too. We are not allowed to leave the wealth that belongs to others in our own hands. It doesn't belong to us and we say, no, we'll sort it out. Don't worry. We're just brothers and sisters. When do you know or how do you know when you are going to die? How do you know what Allah has in store for you? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us learn a lesson. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, wait until Allah dictates or decides. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses. 
للذكر مثل حظ الأنثيين. The verses of inheritance starting from verse number 11 of Surah An-Nisa. Making mention very clearly that Allah has instructed you to distribute the inheritance in a certain way. You have no say how that inheritance will be distributed. It is Allah who has declared what will happen to it. Allah has given each person a leeway of up to one third to decide whom they would like to give for as long as the person they want to give is not an heir that has been declared by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These rules are very deep and I think we need to learn them. The rules and laws of inheritance affect every single one of us. So the Prophet sallallahu calls their uncle and says, give two thirds to these girls. Subhanallah, 66.6%. Two thirds should go to these girls and then you can deal with the rest. Subhanallah. This was the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to pause for a moment. The verse says, which means for a male is double the share of a female. A lot of people find fault with the verses of the Quran in terms of inheritance, not realizing Islam and Sharia is a system and a way of life. If you are to follow it correctly, you would understand the correctness of this beautiful distribution. In Islam, a female is always to be looked after financially by her closest male relative, be it a father or an adult son or a husband. Those are the closest in terms of relation. If they do not exist, then the brother. If he does not exist, then one of the uncles. It is your duty to look after the female who is closest related to you in terms of food, clothing and accommodation. Did you know that? It's supposed to come from your wealth. It is your responsibility. The problem is today, the men don't do it. Do you know what they do? They claim from the wealth of that woman to say, you know what, let's go half half. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. So at the time prior to Islam, women were being inherited and they were bought and sold. Perhaps we will see it in the next few verses. And Islam came in and not only abolished all that, but what happened is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, how dare you consider women commodities? In fact, they are to be owners of commodities just like you are. They cannot be considered a piece of merchandise to be thrown from side to side. Never. A woman has a status, even though she does not need the money in Islam. Why does she not need it? Because moments ago, we just said the closest male relative should be looking after her basic needs. That's Islam. She doesn't need it. But look how beautiful Islam is. The more distant that male relative is, the bigger her share becomes. Amazing. If you have a brother with you, then you share it in a way that he gets double you and he's supposed to look after you from that wealth. As for what you got as a female, it's only yours to keep and perhaps to save, to invest and maybe to spend on something when you want to spoil yourself a little bit here and there. Amazing. But when it comes to the person related to you being an uncle, being a distant relative, then you either get half if you are one female or you get two thirds if you're more than one. Amazing. Two thirds. There is no share in the shari, shares of inheritance, which goes up to 66.6% except for females. Did you know that? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May Allah grant us a deep understanding. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these verses and he clarified the position so clearly for every one of us. There is justice in Islam. And I want to perhaps give you an example by figures for you to understand. Say if a person passes away, leaving behind $75,000. $50,000 would go to the son and twenty-five to the daughter if he's left behind only one son and one daughter. The 25,000 that went to the daughter is hers alone. Nobody can tamper with it whatsoever. She can pack it, invest it, do what she wants with it. Alhamdulillah. Her basic needs, she must still go to the same brother who claimed 50,000 and must tell him, listen, you need to pay for my food, clothing and accommodation. And on top of that, he must look after his wife and his children. So if he's got about eight dependents or 10, divide the 50,000 by 10, you only get 5,000 each. She's sitting with 25 plus the other five. Do you see the justice of Islam where a woman is raised so high, but people who don't know the entire system, they come to you and tell you, look, you're getting a smaller share. And the women stand up and they say, Islam has oppressed us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand that in fact, Islam has raised you higher than you can imagine. May Allah forgive us. There is a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari 
narrated by Jabir radiallahu an. He says, I was unconscious, very sick on my deathbed. And the Prophet sallallahu visited me with Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an. And the Prophet sallallahu saw me in this condition and he called for some water. He made wudu with the water. Then he took some of the water and he sprinkled it on my face. And I gained consciousness. And when I gained consciousness, I asked him, O oh messenger, what should I do with my wealth? Imagine on his deathbed, he's worried, my money, my wealth that I've got, what should I do? Do you know why he was so worried? He was from amongst those who's termed kalala in the Arabic language. Kalala means malla wala dalahu wala walid. One who does not have children and he does not have parents. Just him and perhaps his wife. He doesn't have children, he doesn't have parents. What should happen to me? I am kalala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses clarifying the issue of Kalala. These verses are also made mention of. They are separated into two different places. The end of the surah as well as here where the verses of inheritance are made mention of. Notice the term Kalala. Allah is making mention of how the brothers and the sisters of this person come into the equation and how to split the wealth between the brothers and the sisters. Like at the end of the surah, Allah says, Yastaftunak. They are asking you. Asking you about what? About Kalala. Tell them, Allah will give you the fatwa. Allah will give you the ruling regarding Kalala. And then it continues to say exactly how if there is one sister, she will get half. Two sisters, they get two thirds. If they are sisters and brothers, they will share it and so on. And if they are brothers and sisters only from a mother and they are not real brothers and sisters in terms of sharing both parents, then there is another way of distribution. This is amazingly made mention of in great detail in the Quran. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. Verse number 19 of Surah An Nisa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about something very interesting, something bad that used to happen that was abolished by Islam. According to Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anh, the hadith is made mention of in Al-Bukhari, in Sunan Abi Dawood, as well as Sunan Al-Nasai. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at his time, just prior to when this ruling was actually made clear, when a man dies, his wife was literally inherited by the brother, or by a family member of the man and he had the first option to marry her and she didn't have a say she had to get married to the brother because she would have had the children of the brother who's now deceased so they had a culture whereby the brother needs to marry that woman because they wanted to protect the rest of the children that belong to the same home and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses abolishing that to say no when a man passes away it's the choice of the woman what she wants to do you cannot come and say that, look, this is what will happen. She has a say. She is a human being. Look at how Islam has raised the status of a woman. From that oppressive culture, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes up. Verse number 19 of Surah An-Nisa. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, la yahillu lakum an tarithu nisa akarha. O you who believe, you are not allowed to inherit the women against their will. Inheriting women? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So this was also abolished in a beautiful way by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I give you verse number 22 of the same surah, also connected to the oppression against women and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abolished it. There was another very bad culture and the culture was, if a man has had children, when he passes away, if he has a wife, one of the children who does not belong to that woman would actually marry that woman. Did you hear what I just said? Let me try and explain it to you a little bit more simply. If a man has had more than one wife, the children of one wife, the male, the males, the adults from the one wife would marry the other one. When the father passes away, Islam came in and abolished it completely and totally and calls it fahisha. Fahisha meaning immoral, immorality. It's unacceptable. She is the wife of your father. Come what may, she remains your mahram. Allahu Akbar. Look at this. A woman didn't have a choice. She was just, you know, thrown from pillar to post. And when Islam came to liberate her, they said, nowadays they say, Islam has actually enslaved a woman. Astaghfirullah. Go back in history and see. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand. 
So according to some narrations, narration that is made mention of in by at tabarani in Al-Kabir, and Ibn Abi Hatim has also spoken of the same narration. In some of the narrations, a name is mentioned. Some of them, a name is not mentioned. But let's say the name. There was a man called Abu Qais. He passed away and his son Qais told his other wife that, listen, I need to marry you. She said, I consider you a child, man. I consider you a son. I was married to your father. So she rushed to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam complaining. And so Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed beautiful verses, straightforward, direct, clean cut to the point. Do not marry those whom your father has married. Allahu Akbar. Those whom your parents, your father, grandfather, and so on, going up the ladder, have married. You are not allowed to marry them. They are your mahram. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is indeed very bad. It is immoral. It is sinful. And it is a very bad path. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us respect the family members of ours, our parents and all the others. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and protect us all from any form of immorality. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and grant us Jannah. Ameen. Another very interesting verse, another story, verse number 32 of Surah An-Nisa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of Something amazing, a narration in Sunan Al-Tirmidhi reported by Umm Salama radiallahu anha. She says, some of the women raised a complaint saying, the men are the only ones who can join the army. You see the army joined by men only in terms of the combat in the front rows, the men only. The women have a different role to play. And they complained as well about this issue of wealth, the issue of inheritance. Obviously, it, it was explained to them and they knew it later on. But it is reported that some of them, names are not mentioned, they raised the matter. But before it could go any further, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses explaining to us something interesting. Before I say the verse, that's verse number 32 of the surah. I want to say something. Are you a male by choice? The answer is no. Are you a female by choice? The answer is no. Who decided that you will be male or female? It is Allah and Allah alone. He who made me chose a path for me. He who made me chose my gender. And that's it. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who chose it. And a believer surrenders. A believer understands that Allah has placed on the shoulders of the males a certain role to play. Shoulders of the females, certain roles to play. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept us equal in terms of our link with him. But physically, we're different. Emotionally, we're different. And in a few other ways, we may be different. But that does not mean we are not equal in terms of humanity. It does not mean we are not equal in terms of spirituality and closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are certain acts of worship that a woman can engage in that will earn her closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that a male does not have the opportunity to engage in. For example, bearing children, for example, going through the monthly cycle and so on. If these things happen with the sabr and the patience and forbearance for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the woman will actually have such a high status, which man can actually go through these great acts of worship known as the sabr upon what Allah has tested them with. So there are different roles to play. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَتَمَنَّوْا مَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ بَعْضَكُمْ عَلَىٰ بَعْضٍ Do not wish for that which Allah has favored one gender over another. Don't wish for that. Don't say, oh, you know what? It's so bad to be a female. It's so bad. I'm actually upset. I'm hurt. No, we might want to say, mashallah, Allah has favored males in this. And mashallah, Allah has favored females in this. And alhamdulillah, Allah has done this for a female. And Allah has done this for a male. It's Allah's choice. He chose. He knows why. Let us fall under his system and plan. And let us understand. Do not become depressed because of your gender. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand. Alhamdulillah. Remember, the restrictions are very limited. 
In fact, some people take it beyond limits. A lot of people use religion in order to oppress the females without understanding that in actual fact, it is more culture that may be oppressing the female than religion. Religion liberates a woman. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and grant us the true understanding of the term liberation. Amen. Verse number 51 of Surah An-Nisa. In Sunan An-Nasa'i, according to a hadith narrated by Ibn Abbas radiallahu an, he says there was a man known as Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf. He was a Jewish man and he used to swear Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a poet and he used to utter disgusting words against the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One day, he visited Mecca to al-Mukarramah. Now, let me put you into the picture. You have Christians, you have Jews, you have Muslims and you have Mushriks. Mushriks are the polytheists, right? Those who are closest in terms of the concept of Godhood, the Jews and the Muslims. Did you know this? The Jewish people and the Muslims in terms of who they worship and the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they happen to be the closest. Thereafter comes the Christians. Where have the Christians differed? They have differed in terms of the Trinity, in terms of the crucifixion that they claim, in terms of uh, Jesus, they claim being the son of God, whereas we say he is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they say he died for the sins of everyone else. Whereas we say each person is forgiven directly by Allah. Allah does not need to kill off someone in order to forgive the rest of humanity. Rather, Allah can forgive us without killing anyone. So that's the Muslim belief. Now, if you take a look at the polytheists, they are very far, very far from the concept of Godhood of these three faiths. So if we were to be discussing with a Jewish with a Jewish person, we would be speaking about a God that we would both be understanding because they too believe in oneness to a great degree. And this is why if you ask the Jewish who are knowledgeable, they will tell you we are allowed to pray in a mosque, but we're not allowed to pray in a church because in the mosque you won't find all these statues and so on and they worship one God, whereas in the church they have statues and so on and they worship a trinity. That's something you can go and ask and find out and you will see it's correct. So Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf meets the, the Mushrikeen of Mecca and they happen to tell him, hey, you know that man in Medina who's there, he claims that he's better than us. Yet we have this Kaaba, we have the Zamzam, we are the ones who hold the keys here, we are the important ones and look at what he is saying. So Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf says, yes, you are indeed better than him and what he is calling towards. That statement was false. Because he should have been honest and said, look, I might differ with him, but he's calling out to one God. And so I worship one God as well. So we are closer than we are to you, to them. But because he uttered this word, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ta ta clarifies this. And he, he says, أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا نَصِيبًا مِنَ الْكِتَابِ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْجِبْتِ وَالطَّاغُوتِ ويقولون للذين كفروا هؤلاء أهدى من الذين آمنوا سبيلا أولئك الذين لعنهم الله Do you see those from amongst the people who have been granted some knowledge of the book referring here to Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf and the likes remember the wording is very broad so it can include an example that may follow later on so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you see these people they believe in superstition and deities besides Allah. Those who have knowledge of the book, yet they want to believe in superstition and they want to believe in false deities. Taghut, that which is false besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are worshipping everything else. And Allah says, do you see how they are telling the kuffar that those mu'mineen, those believers, those Muslims are further away you are more rightly guided than they are allah says because of that falsehood they have been cursed allah has cursed them may allah not curse us a point i have learned in terms of lesson from this beautiful verse number one abstain from believing in superstition superstitious matters lay your trust in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and go beyond and worship allah and allah alone and understand the differences that we have with other faiths May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us appreciate the goodness that we happen to be in. Then we have a beautiful story, inshallah, I will leave it for tomorrow. By the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will start off with the story of the key of the Kaaba. It is an amazing story 
there are several narrations, one narrated by Al-Wahidi in his book known as Asbab al-Nuzul, Reasons of Revelation, and the others made mention of by as suyuti Ibn Mardawayh, and a few others. Inshallah, we'll mention both of those narrations. And I want to speak about Uthman ibn Talha and Uthman ibn Abi Talha, the difference between the two and when they accepted Islam and the confusion. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand the lives of these beautiful companions. Allah chose them in order to go through all these incidents so that the Quran would be revealed so that it could come to us in a beautiful way where we have a story behind almost all of the verses of the Quran. May Allah bless you all. May Allah grant you all goodness and myself included until we meet again. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.